This is the lecture 12 recording uh, about stimulating beverages, which, uh, by which we're mostly going to be focusing on coffee and tea. And you can see here people picking tea by hand and then preparing tea uh, in a tea ceremony. Just like every lecture, I want you to write down uh, all of your learning goals and I want you taking notes as you go. Uh, these, uh, these notes are very important for studying and so I want you, uh, I want you to have notes, don't just listen. Now, your first set of learning goals is to describe caffeine. We're going to be talking about caffeine uh, as a first part, and you need to be able to talk about it as uh, being very similar to um, one of the DNA nucleotides we've already studied uh, called, uh, I shouldn't say adenine, that should say adenosine, but, uh, but it's very much like the nucleotide adenine, which is one of the four letters of DNA. We are going to describe the positive and negative effects of caffeine on the human body, uh, of which there are several. Um, then we are going to uh, give uh, the caffeine content of coffee, tea, soft drinks, and energy drinks. These are all going to be averages, and we're going to float back and forth between you know drinking the same size or uh, back and forth between the average drink size, because obviously your cup of coffee is almost always smaller than uh, a 16 ounce energy drink. And then finally, we'll explain three hypotheses for why uh, plants produce caffeine to begin with. You know, kind of a what's the point. So to start off, let's talk about caffeine. Over here you see that caffeine has a very similar structure to the, uh, to the rings of adenosine. Now if this was the full DNA nucleotide, you'd also see a sugar down here and a few phosphates. This goes all the way back to chapter two. The uh, the reason why caffeine blocks drowsiness is that adenosine uh, rings are used as, a, as one of your neurotransmitters in your brain to start you uh, thinking about sleep. Okay, so caffeine blocks uh, the action of those receptors uh, by jumping in there as if it were adenosine but not fitting quite right. Okay, and so it, it blocks the ability of your brain to get drowsy. So where do we get this caffeine from? While you can synthesize it uh, synthetically, a lot of thing, uh, a lot of caffeine pills uh, that that are out there uh, come from uh, the natural decaffeinating process of coffee. I said natural. The chemical decaffeination process leaves you the caffeine, and so we're making enough uh, a caffeine-free coffee and caffeine-free tea uh, that we can uh, we can use some of that caffeine as a, a literal drug uh, when you talk about something like no dose or whatever. Okay. The plants that most commonly have the caffeine uh, falls into two categories. You have seeds and fruits. Okay, So the fruit of coffee, uh, also chocolate, also something called the cola plant. Okay, The, uh, the fruit of it and particularly the seeds have caffeine in them. In tea plants, it's actually the leaves that has the caffeine in it. And that will become important when we talk about the hypotheses about it. Quick review, this is adenine. Okay, original uh, DNA nucleotides were a nitrogen containing ring, okay, a sugar, and a phosphate group. All right, so adenosine is just the nitrogen containing ring, okay, and that sucker uh, looks an awful lot like caffeine here, a differently shaped nitrogen containing ring. Now let's talk about the effects of caffeine. Besides waking you up, caffeine also has uh, some good and some bad benefits or uh, effects. Caffeine uh, constricts blood vessels. Okay, so this raises your blood pressure, which is not a good thing. Uh, but one of the things that it does do is this reduces headaches. So uh, caffeine uh, shows up a lot of times along with uh, aspirin and ibuprofen. So it's a good headache medicine for that reason. It also uh, increases both your heart rate and your fat burning. Okay, so this will boost the wakefulness factor of it. Um, also, this is why uh, some athletes will do a little bit of, uh, will take in some kind of caffeine right before a game. Uh, and then this is also why it's a, a component of weight loss medications. There's also a little bit of an appetite dampening effect. So if you drink a cup of coffee, you'll often find uh, it, it tamps down your hunger. And that's why a lot of people just have a cup of coffee for breakfast. Finally, speaking of not good effects, uh, caffeine is an addictive substance. It's unregulated, 
which makes it unique amongst uh, addictive substances. It's one of the few things that is absolutely a drug that, uh, that there are no laws governing uh, really um, the, the, the accessibility of caffeine to any age person. Okay, it, the proof that it's addictive is uh, once you're drinking coffee or tea regularly, if you just stop for a couple days, you'll get uh, irritability, which is a standard uh, uh, addiction response. But then you also get the headaches and drowsiness uh, that caffeine was suppressing. Okay, so your blood vessels, you know, open up really wide. Your blood pressure drops. That causes you some headaches. And then your uh, your body has been overproducing adenosine. Uh, to kind of counteract the caffeine. And so now when the caffeine's gone, you've got an overproduced adenosine and you can't seem to stay awake. Okay, so it's probably a good thing to get off caffeine, uh, but the uh, pluses and minuses of caffeine seem to balance out as far as life. I mean, you have a reduced incidence of Parkinson's disease and, uh, and things like that. So um, it seems to be not a big problem as long as you drink like uh, around less than 20 ounces of coffee a day, for example. All right, let's talk about dosing caffeine. You have a table in your book, and I want to point out one weird thing. I don't know where this five ounce cup of nonsense came from. That's not actually uh, the proper caffeine dosage. These are all eight ounce cups, not five ounce cup. All right, so coffee is our starting point. It has an average of 100 milligrams of caffeine in it. That's a tenth of a gram. That's a pretty large dose. Uh, of a drug, um, you tend not to, you know, hundreds of milligrams is, is a pretty big dose. Uh, for example, I think your average uh, uh, Tylenol tablet is uh, like 200 milligrams. Okay. Now, if you're drinking tea, you get about half that at 50 milligrams. Okay. Uh, cola, okay, is the same concentration of caffeine as tea. But most people drink more caffeine when they're drinking cola because more people drink more caffeine and more of a cola than they do of tea. So it's not just your eight ounce serving. Nobody drinks an eight ounce serving of Coke. They always drink a 12 ounce serving. And I want to pause on that note for cola, okay, and give you a little history here. Cola, cola seeds, okay, cola, you know, nut is what it's called, but it's really the cola seed, okay. That's, uh, that's the source of caffeine in Coca Cola, okay. And it's, uh, it's still used even today, and it's part of the flavoring of it. The original Coca-Cola uh, recipe was, um, it was the cola leaf, or, I mean the cola nut, cocaine leaves, okay, so cocaine was in there, there's your coca, and then they, uh, you know, uh, they threw in a whole bunch of sugar to make it taste better. Okay, it was originally not, uh, not a sparkling drink. All right, so that's a little bit of Coca-Cola history. Let's come down to energy drinks. Um, energy drinks have more caffeine uh, per ounce, uh, even than uh, you know than than Coke. Okay, but I would say on you know if you're if you're trying to average it out, it's nearly the same concentration as coffee, just a little less than coffee. But here's the deal: all of those energy drinks you get are are pretty much in a tall can every time, so they tend to be like a 16 ounce serving instead of a 12 ounce serving. That's why I've bumped it up to 160 instead of the 120 that's down here. Okay, so if we're talking about caffeine doses, coffee is the highest concentration at 100 milligrams uh, per cup. Okay, tea is half that. Cola is just like tea at half that, but you drink more. And energy drinks are uh, closer to coffee, but once again, you drink more. So you get a lot more caffeine that way. Now, let's talk about the reason why a plant would produce some caffeine. Okay, The first one, we know that uh, caffeine in tea leaves is an insecticide. So if, uh, if, some, uh, if some caterpillars are trying to chew on the leaves, it will slow them down. I don't know exactly why it is a paralyzing effect for uh, insect larva, but it is. Uh, so for you, it's a stimulant. For insect larva, it's a it's paralysis inducing. Okay, so that's the one use of caffeine. Now, what is caffeine in seeds for then? Because you don't have a lot of insects attacking seeds. Well, when caffeine from seeds and from the pulp of fruits uh, of the coffee plant, because it does produce a full fruit, um, when that's in the soil, it prevents other seeds from germinating. So it's a competitive thing. Uh, but that might just be a side effect of the caffeine. Here's something I, uh, I would like to point out. All fruits are designed to be 
eaten. And the coffee fruit is no different. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, chocolate fruit, the coca fruit, the cola nut, all of these things are designed to be eaten and they are eaten by animals. And if it's addictive to uh, an animal nervous system, then I wonder if part of the reason that they're producing the caffeine is literally to addict their animals that are eating the fruit, you know? Because if you're in a jungle where a lot of these things grow, there's a lot of different fruits. There's a lot of competition for animals to eat your fruit. A lot of the fruit goes uneaten. So, uh, so you need to put something special in there to get your fruit eaten. Uh, so I would be very interested to see what the effect of caffeine is on, for example, birds. Birds being the primary eater of coffee, as an example. All right, so that's the background on caffeine. Now let's move into coffee itself. Hmm. Here's what we're gonna do. We are gonna try to use terms from previous lectures um, to describe coffee plants. So we're gonna describe their biology, we're gonna describe uh, their taxonomy, uh, their classification, you know, and uh, we're gonna try to talk about their flowers and their fruits using terms from uh, all of our recent lectures. That's a theme of this lecture. Maybe you noticed I already jumped all the way back to lecture two and showed you DNA again. Okay, so that's the first thing that we're gonna do. Then we're gonna talk about the process of uh, roasting coffee and the actual chemistry of what's going on. Okay, so that you once again are connecting some science to your, uh, your human uh, drinks. Okay, then we're gonna talk about the geography and consumption of coffee, just for a little bit of history. And then we're gonna take some terms from just, that we just used last lecture, and we're gonna talk about the modern farming of coffee. Okay, and so we're gonna talk about monoculture and polyculture. So, the coffee plant, uh, the one that we are most commonly associated with is Coffea Arabica. Well, you know, it's Arabica coffee. It started in Ethiopia, okay, it's native to Ethiopia. And whenever you see Arabica beans, this is the species you're, you're dealing with. There are other brands of coffee uh, plants, not brands, uh, species of coffee plants. Uh, they, they tend to use different coffee plants for different purposes. Uh, for example, if you're using instant coffee, it tends not to be Arabica uh, because it doesn't taste as good. Okay, and there's also other, uh, other uh, species of coffee plant that are more resistant to a fungus that grows in different parts of the world. So depending on where your coffee is being grown, they'll tend to use a different plant. But we focus now on Coffea arabica because it's easier, okay? This is an evergreen plant, but I don't want you to think evergreen like a uh, conifer. I want you to think evergreen like tropical, okay? So most tropical plants are evergreen, just like most of your conifers are evergreen, because there's no seasons in the tropics uh, per se. There's no time of year where it would be great to just foomp, drop all your leaves. Uh, so that's why it's evergreen. And it's a shrub or tree. I say shrub or tree. The two words are kind of synonymous. Whoops. Uh, it just has to do with how tall do you get. All right. So we're going to have clusters of white flowers growing on this. And, uh, and oh, look at those clusters of white flowers. That should be bringing up a term to mind for you. What do we call it when flowers grow in long clusters like this? And then also the beans over here are, the, when we talk about coffee beans, what we're really talking about is coffee is producing a berry with two seeds inside, and it's the seeds inside that we call beans, just because of their shape. The shape of the seed makes it look more like, like a pinto bean or like you know a black eyed pea or something like that. So it doesn't quite look like a seed. Also, I think with coffee beans, they may crack the shell of the seed open. Um, so that you're you're looking less at the the what something that looks like a seed and something that looks more you know a softer texture. All right, let's talk about some biology for coffee. All right, taxonomy of coffee. So, Phylum Magnoliophyta, which is also sometimes called Anthophyta, which we also know is synonymous with the term Angiosperm. Okay, this is the phylum of flowering plants. We know that because this thing has a flower. It's also in dicot or eudicot, whichever your professor prefers in lecture, or I mean in lab. This is meaning it has the two seed leaves, okay? And it's in something that we'll call the super order. Some people just call it a clade. They don't even try to put a, a layer of taxonomy on it, okay? 
but it's a it's a layer between class and order that we needed uh, where the asteroids are this is a this contains the order asteroles which we've already studied in a previous lecture you know around lecture seven i believe or eight maybe is the fruits and flowers one this is the daisies and sunflowers so coffee isn't in the order of daisies and sunflowers it's in one group higher a super order called asteroids all right now we've studied fruits so this one's going to be simple and it's going to be fleshy okay even though you see the bean as dried you've, you're seeing it after we cooked the bean and that's that's a seed remember that's dry not the fruit that's dry and because the flower is complete it has both male and female parts you can see that right here so we have our sepals there we go we have our petals okay we have our uh, our male parts they're going to produce the pollen okay we have our stamen and we have our carpal okay which is going to be the female parts here in the center it's going to receive the pollen so there's your complete flower and it grows as an inflorescence because per stalk you're getting multiple flowers popping out you can see it right here you've got one two three popping out from the same location and then as we noticed up here they just grow in bunches like crazy amounts now that's the biology of coffee we've used some terms from the past now let's talk about how you get from that biology to a drink okay so both tea and coffee we're going to find out are technically a fermented beverage okay they're not they don't go what's called through what's called alcohol fermentation they go through a bacterial fermentation instead not you know yeast tend to go through alcohol fermentation these these guys ferment with bacteria so it's the same kind of fermented that takes you from milk to uh towards um uh, yogurt and cheese okay so that's that lactic acid fermentation we didn't really talk about those uh but there you go okay and then when you start the seeds look green these are the things that are called the beans and uh, after you have allowed them to ferment for between one and three days depending on the exact method they're going to remove those seeds and dry out the seeds okay then by roasting them they're going to convert them from having a whole bunch of starches in the inside of the seed to having a whole bunch of sugar monomers and maybe some dimers okay so you're going to get a lot of glucose and you're going to get some maltose which is that dimer of two glucoses together because remember starch is just a long chain of glucose oh i took you back to chapter two again look at me doing that okay now as that sugar lightly burns you see something called caramelization okay this happens in most of your food when bread is browning you're seeing caramelization when you get you know those pretty scorch marks on your steak uh, the only reason why those pretty scorch marks appeared and turn so black okay is because there was plant material on your steak they rubbed it uh, with some kind of sugar uh, and or things like paprika which have starch and fiber in it all of which can caramelize as the sugars darken so I want you to notice darkening of your food when you cook it when you talk about you know black black lines appearing that's gonna almost always involve some sugar in fact if you want to grill chicken and get it to do anything other than go from pink to white you have to soak it in something that involves either a sugar or a starch or a fiber so for example i soak my uh, my chicken in italian dressing plenty of sugar in italian dressing gives nice scorch marks on there so that was a little bit of an aside that won't be on a test but uh roasting is going to break down the starch turn it into some sugars and then those sugars are going to caramelize which is what gives you uh, a dark brown color to your beans okay if you're roasting these beans at 420 uh, this is basically your regular coffee and it has a sweeter flavor I know you don't really think of coffee as sweet you mostly think of it as bitter but if you drink a uh, regular coffee next to something like an Italian roast coffee you'll notice the the difference in the flavor because it goes from sweet to much more bitter and this is because you're roasting it at a higher temperature and that's taking those sugars that were caramelizing and now we're carbonizing them okay it's like when you uh it's like when your grill uh gets dirty and there's pieces of food on there and you just let it continue to cook and those pieces of food turn into black charcoal almost okay that's what's happening when you go to the espresso roast or the italian roast okay so you're going from sweet to more burned flavor 
Incidentally, my dad loves this flavor. He can just, he'll take Italian roast beans and he'll put them in an old popcorn popper, like one of the old school ones where you didn't have microwave popcorn, and he'll roast them some more until the beans crack a second time. It's ridiculous. It's the, you know, like the, the darkest roast I've ever seen in any coffee. I'm, I'm more of a regular coffee roast kind of guy. All right, let's talk about the history of coffee, and I want you to look at this picture. Okay, this is the Arabian Peninsula, sandwiched between India, okay, and Africa. All right, so uh, I know y'all just love geography and are super up on your geography, but I wanted you to know where these places really were. Okay, so the origin of coffee, coffee was first discovered in Ethiopia. Okay, so that's where it, it grows naturally. Okay, that coffee was moved to Yemen, and this is where we're first gonna start cultivating it. Okay, the original use of coffee was you would pick the berries and you just eat them or you might mix them with a little bit of fat to make a snack out of that. We didn't see a beverage form of coffee until what is called the 13th century, that would be the 1200s, and it popped up in Yemen. Also, when we talk about kafia arabica, arabica beans, that's because right here, this is in the Arabian Peninsula. Okay, that's where coffee got started. And I think it's kind of weird, uh, but we, we tend to think you know of, of coffee as something you drink when it's cold outside. Coffee was originally drunk in a place that was pretty darn hot. Okay, so it wasn't a cold drink. All right, now, like we said, they were originally eaten whole, but later a drink was made out of them. And because of the drinking of it, uh, Yemen, the, the entire country, started cultivating this coffee. And it was actually, in this time, Yemen was also uh, already a Muslim nation. And so it uh, the, the coffee started to form kind of a, a bond with uh, the religion of Islam. So uh, worshipers would drink it to stay awake uh, during prayers and meditations, and scholars would drink it to stay awake. And so they knew it was a stimulant, and then they, they got to where they really liked the flavor of it as well. And then it became a social aspect. You know, People would meet and have coffee as a drink. Even if it wasn't time to have a meal, you could always have a cup of coffee. Okay, in the 1600s, the drink got introduced to Europe and by early 1700s got so popular that you had coffee houses uh, opening up. Interesting side note that shows up in your book, there's, a, uh, there's an insurance company that's 300 years old, okay, that started in the 1700s called Lloyd's of London. Lloyd's of London did not start as an insurance company, it started as a coffee house. But the coffee house was popular with uh, insurance brokers, okay, and, uh, and the owner of the coffee house started uh, making connections between the insurance brokers and the shipping industry. And uh, they would have their meetings in the coffee house. And eventually they became a, a quote, insurance broker. They didn't offer the insurance themselves. They just connected the buyer and the seller. Okay, so Lloyd's of London, one of the first insurance broker, uh, you know, brokerage houses, uh, and one of the oldest, started as a coffee business. It'll be interesting to see uh, 200 years from now what Starbucks is actually involved in. I wonder, you know, what will they be involved in besides coffee? Um, so, hey, you know, look, weirder stories have happened. Amazon started as a book selling business. Now they hardly sell books at all because, well, most people don't read paperback books anymore. All right, coming back into these coffee houses, at about the same time coffee houses are showing up all throughout Europe, coffee cultivation spread to the Americas, okay? Because, you know, South America in particular uh, was a particularly good place to grow coffee, okay? And coffee uh, continued to take hold in the Americas and w already had its foothold in Africa and Asia, um, and, you know, particularly in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, and that's a really good thing because in England and Europe, coffee started to decline greatly in the 1800s because that's when tea appeared. So tea is gonna show up about 100 years after coffee and kick coffee's butt as far as Europe is concerned. Uh, but coffee is still gonna remain dominant in the Americas, especially since it's grown right here in something that you can get to the United States in a short uh, you know, ocean trip or even by land bridge from South America. All right. So let's talk about modern coffee production, and we're gonna bring some farming uh, terminology into this. First off, you need to know the scale of the game. Uh, you know, coffee producing countries 
uh, do $12 billion worth of coffee export per year. Okay, that's big money. I know it doesn't seem like big money compared to a you know trillion dollars in national debt, but it's still uh, this you know for many countries we're talking about some pretty poor countries. It can be over half of their GDP uh, or their export. Excuse me, not their GDP, but their 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 exports. So any cash they need to bring into the country is coming from coffee. Uh, so uh, um, to give you an idea how big this business is, uh, the the largest. A traded product, single traded product in the world is oil. The second largest is coffee. So, uh, or coffee, as some of my people up north would say. So, this is a, there's big stakes, and for some countries, this is the lifeblood of the country. Uh, so, uh, be careful uh, as we talk about these next two slides because they're going to get judgy. Okay. We're going to talk about shade grown versus sun grown coffee. And I know you've seen shade grown and, and, and sun grown. Uh, there's also fair trade coffee, but we're not going to talk about fair trade right now because there's not much biology behind it. Uh, so we're going to focus on shade grown. Coffee, first off, is a perennial plant. So that's, that's a good thing. Uh, it's going to grow back every year. Uh, it's going to grow as a bush. Okay, and As long as you keep it kind of trimmed down, you're good. And so this reduces the need for tilling. Okay, That's an idea back from Chapter 11. Remember, tilling uh, increases erosion. Okay, where you have to chew up the soil every year. Also, uh, reduce, you know, increases your need for fertilizers. Well, we don't have to do that. So that's a good thing about coffee to begin with. Now, coffee naturally likes to grow in the shade uh, and, and doesn't have to grow very tall. It's happy to be shadowed by other trees. Okay, so this means you can grow coffee in a, in a polyculture environment and it's pretty happy to do so. Uh, even though it's invasive, in uh, South America because it didn't originate there. It's not problematic, okay? It's not like the kudzu, which is invasive in the United States, or, you know, bamboo, or uh, even, you know, honeysuckle. It might look cool, but it you know, kills other plants. Coffee doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really hoard out many other plants and fits in nicely with the, uh, with the animal life as well. Lots of birds will like eating coffee berries, okay? Since this is a polyculture farming, you don't have to clear jungle land. Okay, so that's good. So we can preserve jungle, which is you know a natural resource, while at the same time growing coffee. This allows your native animals, like those birds I was talking about, to flourish. There's also a lot of uh, small mammals that like to eat coffee berries. So you know it's a win-win. And since you're shade grown and uh, polyculture, polyculture also tends to reduce uh, erosion because you don't have these gaps in between. You have multiple different root networks holding the soil together. And then finally, coffee trees that are grown in the shade will produce for 50 years straight. Uh, you're, I think, uh, think sun-grown coffee only does 10 to 20 years. So you do, you know, you don't have yearly tilling. But if you're going to grow in the sun, you do have to till once every 10 years. So that still increases erosion. So shade-grown has a lot of benefits. But then again, sun-grown has a lot of benefits too. Okay. So if you're doing monoculture. Uh, coffee grown in a field. This means you're doing regular modern agriculture. Okay, so this is going to increase the yield per bush, which means it's going to increase the yield per acre, which means a farmer doesn't have to own as much land. Okay, but they do have to chop down the jungle in order to do this sun-grown uh, agriculture. Okay, this also allows you to do uh, irrigation. You can't really irrigate in the middle of a jungle per se, especially since all the other plants are soaking up the water. So uh, you can, yeah, and I know we're in a tropical environment, but if you're going to be sun-grown, you need even more water, okay? And then uh, this allows you to uh, use machinery, okay, which reduces labor. You can use, uh, you can use more modern uh, technology to harvest your coffee. Uh, and so that, that's all of this together. This reduces the cost of coffee. So it's cheaper for you. Uh, it creates more coffee to be exported. And further, if any country is doing sun-grown at all, then people that do shade grown are going to be out competed. So um, it's not uh, it's not as simple as saying, well, you should convert to shade grown if your competitor is not doing shade grown and price is still important. And I don't know about you, but I care about the price of my food. I like cheap food, so uh, I personally do not uh, buy shade grown coffee, even though I know it's better for the jungle. So there you go, true talk. Now let's move away from coffee and start talking about tea. Because, you know, we are in the South here and everybody loves their, you know, sweet iced tea and whatnot. 
Uh, I'm, I'm a rebel here too. I don't like sweet tea. I like my tea unsweet. I mean, I like sweet tea, but I, I got myself off of sweet tea because I didn't want that much sugar in my diet. So you don't care about that. You care about what's going to be on the test. So what's going to be on the test is that we're going to have to describe the biology and classification of the tea plant just like we did for the coffee plant. Okay. We're going to do our geographic origins and human cultivation and consumption of tea just like we did with coffee. And then we're going to explain the difference between black tea and green tea. And we're going to find out and we'll also add oolong to that. Uh, but it, it's, it, this is uh, similar with talking about uh, how coffee beans are roasted. Uh, this is uh, the preparation process of the tea. Okay, so let's talk about Camellia sinensis. Okay, this is the tea plant. Okay, so tea is primarily uh, taken from leaves from this plant. Okay, and when you're talking about traditional tea, it's using this plant's leaves. If you're talking about an herbal tea, okay, so something made like celestial seasonings or whatever, or when you hear chamomile tea, um, all of those teas are being made from other plants. And you're, you're making them approximately the same way. You're drying and grinding up the leaves and brewing it with hot water. But uh, that, that's the difference between regular tea and herbal tea, is herbal tea is other plants. Now, what is this plant uh, like? Um, it is uh, a small shrub that's native to Tibet, okay, which is part of China, India, and Myanmar. This is what we're talking about. So this range of India, the wetter, more mountainous regions. Okay, here's the Tibet part of China, and you know it, it can even go into the Sichuan region and some you know some non-Tibetan regions of China. Then this place called Myanmar, uh, which used to be called Burma. Okay, sitting over here next to Thailand. So this whole region is where tea is native to and also is where a lot of it is still produced. Okay, and uh, if you're wondering how did tea make it into uh, Europe, well back when back when England was kind of in charge of India for a long time and turned it into a colony, well there's your tea production right there in the middle of India. Okay, now where do you get tea from? Well, let me tell you, you don't get tea from these leaves right here. These leaves are too stiff. What you want to do is you want to take the younger leaves, the ones that haven't fully formed their secondary cell walls yet. Okay, maybe you've noticed leaves that are first popping out are softer than, and, and lighter colored than leaves that have been around a long time. So we're talking about leaves from the apical meristem. Okay, that's what we're talking about. Oh, I brought it back, apical meristem. Yeah, these terms are going to show up again. All right. And then uh, what do you do with these? Well, tea plant is also perennial. It's a bush or a tree, in fact. And so we've got to make it, uh, we've got to prune it to waist height so that people uh, can harvest it. And let me, uh, let me scroll back up uh, to the beginning of the lecture. This right here is a tea field. So these are a whole bunch of trees, okay, that have been pruned to waist height. Um, that makes them easier to harvest, but that also increases the number of these little apical meristem buds because if you chop the tree, you know, you top the, the bush and the tree every year, it's going to need to grow more new leaves. Okay, scrolling back down to T. Okay. We already talked about the geography of it. Now let's talk about the biology of it. Okay, we're once again in, in phylum Magnolia Phyta, so we're going to have a flower. We're once again in dicot, the biggest group in Magnolia Phyta. And once again, we're in the super order of asteroids, just like our coffee was. Okay. But unlike coffee, instead of being closer to the, to the daisies and the sunflowers inside the asteroids, the tea plant is closer to things like blueberries okay, and cranberries. So it's kind of a different, uh, a different side group of the asteroids. And also, unlike coffee, um, we're going to have solitary flowers. Okay. So we're not going to form those uh, inflorescences. We're going to be completely solitary. But similarly, it is a true complete flower. Now, this guy's also going to form a fruit. You can see I, um, that might be a flower about to bud, or it might be the fruit right there. I don't know. But the fruits aren't going to be used for anything. Okay. So we are purely looking at the leaves when we're talking about tea plants. So that's kind of opposite of what we do with the kola nut, the coconut, um, excuse me, the cocoa seed. Right, I'm not talking about a palm tree. I'm talking about cacao, um, and then uh, and also with coffee. We're, we're not going to focus those plants. You ignore the leaves. This plant, you ignore the fruits. 
One side note, there is a, a thing called tea tree oil, okay, which is very common in uh, natural medicine and is considered one of the essential oils that can be used to treat things. Okay, that is a completely unrelated tree. It shouldn't really even be called the tea tree. Okay, so that that's uh, uh, it's just not even close to the same thing. So don't think that tea tree oil, if you're using it in aromatherapy or whatever, don't think that that's actually the tea plant that you drink uh, when you make a cup of tea. It's completely different. Let's talk about the history. So China and India uh, both claim discovery of tea. What's the truth? I don't know. Both could be true. You know, there's mountain range kind of separating China from uh, India. So um, both could have discovered it uh, separately. Uh, but one thing about it is tea was being drunk long before coffee was being drunk uh, as a beverage. Okay, so tea was being drunk in thousands BC. Okay, but uh, it stayed put for a very long time, stayed put for nearly uh, 4,000 years there uh, until Dutch traders uh, went from China and brought the tea all the way back to Holland. Okay, and then about 40 more years before people in England figured this out. And once they did, it started to supplant coffee. Because remember, in 1650, you're drinking coffee in England as a, as a delicacy. And by the 1700s, you've got coffee houses everywhere. But then by the late 1700s, now tea is being imported all over the world. And I know you think of tea being a British drink and, you know, British teas and we're producing tea and the, the British selling tea to the colonies, right? And all that stuff. But you got to remember, first, the tea was grown in India then brought to Great Britain, then distributed from Great Britain to other parts of the world. Okay, so that's that's the biology, the uh, history of where it comes from. One quick note, uh, iced tea and tea bags were both invented in the southern United States, okay, in Louisiana, uh, in, a, in 1904. So right at the turn of the 1900s, uh, tea drinking became very common uh, in the United States as well, but we used it as a cold beverage. Oh, if you're wondering what did they do before tea bags, uh, you may have seen these little metal balls that are made of mesh, okay? And you put loose tea leaves in them, and you close the little metal ball, and you uh, you know you use that to brew your tea, or you would just throw the tea leaves into a pot of hot water, let the tea leaves settle to the bottom, okay, uh, or float to the top, depending on the tea type, uh, and then you uh, you pour out only the water and leave the tea leaves behind. So it could either be um, a little, you know, loose tea uh, mesh gripper, or you just had to deal with the leaves floating in the liquid still. Okay, now let's talk about brewing your tea or how you get from a leaf, a green leaf in a field to, uh, to actual brewing processes. Okay, if you're gonna do black tea, you're gonna go through a withering step it's called withering but i mean basically it's just drying it out for a day it's not completely dried it's just allowed to kind of wilt all right then you're going to roll it so you're pressing it you're crushing it that's going to open up some of the cell walls you're going to allow it to ferment for a few days once again not alcohol fermentation just like with coffee the fermentation just changes the flavor some and then finally there's a baking step if you're talking black tea the black comes from the baking Okay, well, so what is green tea? For the longest time, I mean, literally up until the point where I made this lecture, I thought green tea was a different species, and it's not. Same species of tea, but what you're doing is you're using the leaves more fresh. You don't ferment them. I mean, you still wither them, but not as much. Okay, you don't ferment them, and you don't bake them. You just let them naturally dry. Uh, oolong tea is just halfway between black and green. Okay, and there's a newer thing out called white tea. It's actually using a different variety that has a lighter colored uh, leaves near the apical meristem and also has these you know, weird hairs that stick out. Uh, white teas, I, we don't know much about them. I do wanna note uh, something I meant to say further up in the coffee, not, uh, and I'll also say in the tea, uh, none of these processes alter the amount of caffeine in either coffee or tea. So how much you ferment them, uh, for the, the tea or how much you roast them as the beans. It doesn't make the coffee stronger or, or the tea stronger in terms of caffeine. So if you think you can, you can feel a difference, like blacker coffee gives you stronger caffeine, it's mostly psychosomatic 
And that's the end of the lecture. So please go on and take your quiz.